Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, believe it or not, there are 10 Democrats trying to replace Governor Corbett in next year's gubernatorial election, plus scandal in the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, ah, no way, plus a very important health care update, all of that and more following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, we got a bunch of stuff to get to, and we're going to get to it quickly. Joining me as often is the case, too, the state's leading journalist sitting across from me is Brad Bumstead with the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, columnist as well as Capitol reporter, John Mysick with the Harrisburg Patriot News. He's now the editorial page editor. I won't say Allentown Morning Call. Shamelessly promoting both of your previous, one of your previous yes, employers, John. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go. I'll tell you what, look, you, both you guys have covered governor's elections for, uh, in many cycles. I count 10 people who conceivably could run, try to run against Tom Corbett. They have to win the Democratic nomination. And we're in what? April of the year before the primary. Have you ever seen anything like uh, it's, this? It's getting to be like one of those like 1950s Cecil B. DeMille movies, a cast of thousands, yeah, right? right. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the pack is getting crowded, more and more crowded all the time. Just this last week, we had Tom Wolf, the mm -hmm. former Rendell administration Treasury Secretary from New York, announcing that, or not, Revenue Secretary, excuse me, right. announcing that he was going to get into the race, pledging $10 million of his own fortune for the, uh, for the contest. You know, Democrats look at Governor Corbett's poll numbers, they like their chances, they mm -hmm. smell blood in the water, and now everybody and their brother is running. Yeah, ten, I mean, Brad, you've also covered so many of these. I mean, usually, doesn't the out party the party doesn't have the governorship, have to go, can we find someone to oh, take exactly. on a exactly. governor? Exactly. It's hard to, normally to beat incumbent governors, but they see an opening, they see bad poll numbers, they think they can take them out. The problem is, in a year and a half, things can completely change. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. And Corbett's goal is to raise $30 million. You start advertising, uh, poll numbers go up. But look, I think the other issue he has is, is a potential primary challenge and you know, Bruce Castor, Montgomery yeah. County DA, is talking about running. If that happened, uh, all these Democrats might not get the candidate they want in well, Tom Corbett. Could. Listen to this. Here we go. Kathleen McGinty, a former uh, DEP secretary in this state. Allison Schwartz, a congresswoman from the Philly suburbs. Former congressman and Senate candidate Joe Sestak. Uh, a minister, Max Myers. John Hanger, a former DEP secretary. Tom Knox, a wealthy businessman. The mayor of Allentown, Ed Pulaski. Representative Scott Conklin, a, a Democrat from Center County, I got this right. And Mike Stack, a senator from Philly. I mean, you, John, the other thing is the, uh, the range of people, but interestingly enough, except for one, they're all from the east. Yeah, uh, no, no Western candidates to uh, step up yeah. yet. Typically, you have somebody from out there, uh, which could be, which could do all kinds of amusing things on, in, during the primary, depending on how many people are left standing. But I mean, it's sort of not too early now to start dividing into tier one and to tier two yeah. candidates. Looking at that list of three list tiers. of names, or yeah, three maybe tiers. three tiers. All right, well, let's do that. Let's have fun. I mean, now look, we're not, we're not deciding who's going to win and lose on this program. We're going to say just based on, on. Their, uh, their backgrounds, their experiences, the offices that they held. Brad, I'll start with you. Give me a couple you would put in the top tier. Top tier, I would definitely go with McCord, the state treasurer, Lecter. Allison Schwartz, congresswoman from right. Montgomery, Philadelphia, Joe Sestak, because he's run statewide before, and right. possibly Tom Wolf yeah. uh, as a wild card for the, the top tier, because he has a lot of money. And that's one thing with all these candidates out there. They're going to quickly find they can't do much without money. Yeah, and that state. many people is going to dilute the fundraising. So you it's going to be difficult. That list? Yeah, I mean, that, it's just, I mean the, the herd is going to get thinned inevitably as people start running into problems of raising money. You yeah. put, you know, sort of that, that bottom half, uh, the Reverend Myers from central Pennsylvania, uh, Mayor Pulaski will hate to hear this, but he is also sort of a, yeah. a B-list candidate. Uh, Senator Stack, a very talented and capable public servant, probably not a serious contender as well. Mr. Conklin, who ran for lieutenant governor in 2010 with Dan Honorado, probably not either. So yeah. you can start dividing the herd there. We're going to take a, a, a run to a break. I want to come back and talk about this Turnpike Commission thing. Brad, I know you've done a number of stories that I read about. The other thing that's fascinating is that we now have two candidates on the Democratic side who are talking about running for lieutenant governor. 
this early. Do I got that right? <laughs> I mean, not only do we have candidates coming out of the woodwork, to run for governor, but for lieutenant. I don't remember any of this going back 40 years. It's a good job. <laughs> it's a good job, lieutenant. That's true. That is exactly true. All right. Problems with the Turnpike Commission. Uh, uh, Brad and John are going to weigh in on that uh, after we are uh, talking about money. We'll pay some bills. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation, educating citizens and business leaders about important public policy issues and civic affairs. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by BetterSaferRoads.com. To voice your support for safer highways and less traffic congestion, visit BetterSaferRoads.com. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Hi, welcome back to the program with Brad Bobstein and John Mysick, uh, both both uh, state's uh, leading journalists, among the state's leading journalists. Then we're going to have someone from the Hospital Association. Governor Corbett uh, had an important meeting uh, this past week with the Secretary of HHS. We're going to get an update on that and Medicaid expansion. But first, a scandal with, uh, I'm going to qualify this and say the Turnpike Commission itself. We want to make sure we got this narrowly focused. Brad, you've done a ton of stories on this. Pay to play. Give us a quick overview of what of what uh, has been ha happening. Who's been charged? And go ahead. Well, for starters, there there's the attitude that people have about this, and that is, um, you know, what there's corruption at the Turnpike Commission. It's like there's crime in New York City, <laughs> and. Uh, but State Police Commissioner Frank Noonan, when the charges were announced, addressed that, and he said, yeah, there's been rumors for years, but nobody's ever been able to prove it. Yeah. The difference is that for years, we talked about patronage and cronyism at the Turnpike Commission. What's alleged now are very serious charges, conspiracy, bribery, uh, and, and a whole pay-to-play scheme where uh, contracts allegedly were rigged, uh, that, that contractors who gave campaign money to designated senators yeah got the work. Those who didn't, didn't work. That's called yeah. pay to play. Go ahead, John. Uh, jo uh, John, yes. eight people, if I got this right, have been charged, right? Mm -hmm. Eight people. There's a lot of what we used to call old-fashioned patronage going on there. That's right. Uh, there's been some effort by the new CEO of the Turnpike. Do I got that right, Brad? Yes. Who's talked about reform. W what is it that is in the air that possibly could change the practices at the Turnpike. Well, I mean, the, the new the new CEO is saying that, he, or yeah, the new CEO is saying he wants to set a different tone. That it's a different Turnpike Commission to the one that uh, that was to the one that was in place when it was right. charged. I mean, it's important to note that some of the people who were in place, who are who've been charged in this probe, are no longer in place at the agency. Joe Bermeyer, the former CEO, right. out of a job. Mitchell Rubin, the former Turnpike Commission chairman, out of Go a job. On. Bob Mello, the former Senate minority leader who was charged. A bad 2012-13 uh, for him, and he'd already been convicted on a separate federal racketeering yep. charge in, in or corruption charge, rather, excuse me, in Scranton. So a lot of the players who were in, within the agency at the time aren't there anymore, and the new CEO is saying, well, he's trying to set a new tone going forward, yeah. and you know, we'll see how that works. There's right. a political element to this as well. This investigation was started four years ago by Republican Governor Tom Corbett when he was Attorney General. It was an investigation of Democratic appointees at the Turnpike Commission under former Democratic Governor Ed Rendell. Kathleen Kane, the new Democratic Attorney General, got this handed to her. This, right. it was, it was, the grand jury report was sent over to her, and she could have squelched it. She could have said there wasn't enough proof there, but she went with it. Yeah. And Noonan, in particular, who used to be Corbett's investigator uh, at the Attorney General's office, praised her for uh, quick action on this. Yeah. You know, one of the things that struck me over the years, and both of you follow the legislature, John, maybe you're not quite as careful now you got to run a paper and do all the editorial stuff, was this business about should the Turnpike Commission even exist? I mean, folding it into PennDOT, I've heard conversations about that. Maybe you have trouble with how, how 
the various projects get funded, you know, the, the complexities of all that. Is there, have either of you heard any serious discussion about folding the turnpike operation into the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation? Well, there's new talk about that now. It's been, yeah. been there for years. Yeah. There'll be a renewed effort, particularly by House Republicans, to try to do that. But look, you have 2,100 people work at the Turnpike Commission. There are about 500 or so of those that are managers, uh, and this is to run 509 miles of highway. Yeah. I mean, why do you need so many people? Uh, turn the problem, though, with folding the Turnpike Commission into PennDOT is you would bring with that eight billion dollars in debt. Yeah, and they're, they're, the question is, ahead. how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, there are yeah. deep structural debt problems. The Turnpike yeah. right now is a consequence of Act 44 of 2007, which is the law that was supposed to toll Interstate 80 in northern Pennsylvania. The other half of that was that the Turnpike borrowed against tolling revenues to mm -hmm. transfer to PennDOT for road and bridge reconstruction. And yeah, I mean, and this is now being put back on, on motorists who are facing increased tolls to meet, meet this mounting debt load. All of that stuff, all those structural financial problems would be shoved onto PennDOT. And one would suspect yeah. that no merger would take place until that debt is massaged in some way. The, the, Go news, ahead. the new CEO of the Turnpike Commission, uh, Mark Compton, told me in an interview that he's intent on changing the culture at the Turnpike Commission. And he makes a good point, and that is that this... Uh, grand jury presentment isn't about most Turnpike employees. It's a, yeah, it's a I think small group. We ought to point that out that yeah. you know you got uh, all sorts of workers who get up every day, do their job, right? You guys you have good people there, yeah, honest good people. people. There. They're just doing right. their jobs, and but but I think over the years, all of us had heard rumors of, course. of pay to play, and it took, you know, it's been going on for decades, and yet it takes so long to, and and you think after bonus gate you know, which both of you covered a, a great deal, you know, 25 charges against staffers and law, ex lawmakers, that somehow the culture doesn't seem to have taken the next turn for reform, John. Am I right or wrong about that? Um, I think I think to a degree. But, I mean, again, a lot of, if you look at Bonusgate, if you look at some of the other sort of scandals that come, Senator Fumo, for instance, right. these are people who are no longer on the political stage. Yeah. So it's theoretically possible to argue that maybe the state has turned a corner in terms of reform. I'm not going to say that. I say it's theoretically possible right. because all these players are no longer in yeah. politics, but again, sort of the, the lingering sort of structural problems in state government within the state's political culture. Yeah. I don't think there's been sort of like the psychological sea change yet that, that we can say that all that stuff and is behind us. They haven't done real ethics reform and campaign, campaign finance. finance. Exactly. I mean, some right. of the things that that reformers have talked about over the years. Go ahead, Brad. I don't want to interrupt. Well, you. to take a moment to, to blatantly plug my upcoming book, Keystone Corruption. <laughs> you one can of come the, on the program. Yeah. I had who's that guy? John Bear. You all yeah. know John Bear. The yeah. But one of the and themes we'll, in there is the cyclical nature yeah. of corruption. Uh, we have a big scandal, then for a couple of years, everybody's good. Everybody wants to reform. Yeah. There, nobody, you know, has their hand in the cookie jar, maybe even five, six, seven years. Yeah. But then things slack up and somebody sticks their hand back in the jar. There you go. Well, I have a book coming out, too, on Pennsylvania politics. I'm going to shamelessly plug it. Maybe I'll let you guys sit over here and you can interview me. All right. We got a very important health care update. You want to stick around for this about the expansion of Medicaid. We're going to talk to uh, one of our experts that we call in from time to time to chat about that following these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania and by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, important news this week on the healthcare front. Joining me to talk about that is Paula Bassard. She's a senior VP with the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. Paula, pretty big news. The governor who has wanted a meeting with HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius got that meeting last week. 
And, he's, and you can describe it. It was that, well, things are cordial and I got questions yet. Yeah, go ahead. Talk about that. Pretty important meeting. Yes it or no? It was important because the governor and his administration had a lot of questions about what they could do or not do in expanding Medicaid to mm -hmm. uninsured Pennsylvanians. Coming out of the meeting, um, what the reports are is that the secretary conveyed what flexibilities there were, and the governor has indicated that he's considering some of those um, opportunities for Pennsylvanians, which is important. Yeah, you yeah, want to talk about that. I mean, I tweeted a while back that the governor People didn't, a lot of people were saying he closed the door. He, didn't, he hasn't closed it. Let's start with that. He may close it completely. But am I right? At this point, there's no closed door. The Pennsylvania's, you know, the, the Medicaid expansion, you know, provided under the Affordable Care Act and the Supreme Court decision. Go ahead. The governor never had the door closed. Right. What the state has always raised questions about the affordability. And as you may know, we commissioned a study by Rand Health that shows, if you look at the bigger economic picture, that the increased economic activity in the state, the increase of some taxes, over the time period, Pennsylvania should have sufficient taxes yeah. to cover their costs. I think the governor's other issue is some of the flexibilities they want to really match program with right. Pennsylvania's right. needs. Yeah, the one concern he expressed was, and I, he actually used the percentage that I, I, I thought a little bit different when I'd used, health care, particularly the Medicare Cade portion of it, you go into the, 24% of the state budget. He said it was 27%. <clears throat> Maybe that's this year compared to last year. But having said that, <clears throat> he's also talking about a program where you would use the money from Medicaid but allow people to buy private insurance. But I hear that could be more expensive. Well, I think it's important to understand that the purchase of individual insurance is always more expensive than the purchase of group health coverage because right. you spread the risk. Pennsylvania already has, um, f in its Medicaid program, they purchase in bulk um, through Medicaid HMOs. And so Pennsylvania could build on that very successful yeah. health choices program, maybe looking at a different benefit package because what you're predominantly looking at are adults who are working. They're just working at jobs that right. don't have insurance or their income levels from those jobs aren't sufficient for them to buy insurance. So, you, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there for the state that we think um, it's good that they explore. Yeah, now, there is and any, uh, let, <clears throat> let me ask you another point. I hear different figures and maybe it's not, I, I think it's pretty important, 340,000 people if we expand, I've seen figures at 550,000. I mean, th this isn't a, a small debate, is it, over the number of people who would get covered? Well, I mean, we're the, talking about a lot of people what you're, here. What you're looking at between, there's, there's two things that are going to happen in 2014 if the state expands Medicaid. So you'll have individuals and small businesses that should be able to begin purchasing through right. these, the federally run insurance exchange. That'll take care of a certain number of people, and then the opportunity to expand Medicaid. Okay. And so depending on how you design it, more might get through the exchange, more might be with Medicaid. But ultimately, if Pennsylvania does both, 95% of Pennsylvanians will have health okay. insurance coverage, and that's really the end result. Okay, we're going to run to a break, and when we come back, I want to talk about patient safety and quality, uh, a report that the Hospital Association has put out just recently with Paula. Uh, we'll do that uh, after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back to the program with Paula Bussard. We're from the Hospital Association. We're talking about a variety of healthcare issues. One that we've gotten into in the past has to do with patient safety and quality. 
an issue that has really moved to the forefront, I think, in the last decade. Do I got that right? I mean, just yes. much more emphasis on it. All right, give us a, a latest update on, you, you issued, a, you have a report, and what are the key findings of it? Well, what we are seeing is that when hospitals have a relentless focus from their board level on down, that you can reduce things like healthcare infections, right. pressure, and you can prevent pressure ulcers. And with a lot of work and effort with others in the healthcare system, nursing homes, home healthcare, you can reduce readmissions. And we're seeing the results, which are good for Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, uh, you know, better quality of care, better outcomes but it does take a relentless focus to really um, put that value at the Do you have any forefront. percentages that, that, uh, 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 that you could cite that uh, we often talk about when you deal with you know, readmissions or just well, in general seen, your ability? Go ahead. We've seen infections over the last three or four years come down by about 40%. Wow. That's pretty significant. Yeah. We have seen pressure ulcers come down by 25%. More recently, we've seen a reduction in preventable readmissions of about 20%. Um, and so looking at, okay, what next? How to bring it down even right. further? How to get to zero and in all of those areas so that we are delivering the best quality yeah. care. But I mean it starts at the top and then you have to, and we've talked about this before, build an infrastructure within the facility so that nurses and aides and other folks who are dealing with patients are, you know, doing the right thing. And I would think, man, when you get in, we get into flu season. I mean, you know, just think about that and all the people in and out seeing patients, you know, and I'm, I'm a little compulsive, obsessive about, you know, using. But you raise, you raise influenza. Yeah. When hospitals and health systems started looking at vaccination of their own health care workers as part of a patient safety issue, right. they were securing vaccination rates amongst their workers 95%, meaning the spread of influenza when people do yeah. come into the hospital went down because you didn't have the workers spreading it yeah. because of the vaccination. So those kinds of challenges around being relentless. Yeah, the other thing you bring up, point, yeah. the infrastructure, a key part of that is the patient and their family. Right. So making sure they know what they need to know to take to go home, manage yeah. their care. Because the first thing they do is you run in and you hug, you know, you hug someone you love, right? You, and who knows if they washed their hands. That's you know exactly. I, and even you know exactly. It's weird because I never even we never I never even thought about that. You know, we always say, well, you know, we'll check the hospital personnel, but it also could be the it's relatives and us. the loved ones, right? All of us. Yeah. Well, I remember and we're about out of time, but interestingly enough, when I was doing my early teaching, guess what? We had situations where new teachers, new teachers would be out half the time because they would get the infections from the young kids, exactly. particularly in the you know elementary school grade. We go, okay, what's going on here? Well, you know, you have to build in time because the kids were sick, because the teachers were sick from getting what the kids had, similar Same thing, Same right? thing with healthcare workers. Yeah. We have the most vulnerable individuals That's in hospitals, and we have to protect them. All right, thanks for the great update. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, you stay well.